Let's see your right presentation. Now, yeah. uh, I think I'm sharing. Do you? Yes. You can. Can you put on uh, presentation mode so we? Mm -hmm. uh, better. I can do better. Let's see. Here. Let's try this. Yeah, it works. But but you're not in presentation mode, right? You prefer to. Hey, it's okay. Yeah. Oh no. Let's try again. Well, that's that is strange. But you we can do see, see it. those lights. Yeah. You see it. Okay. You I'm, I'm not sure why, but it'll work. Do, do you have any animation in your presentation? No. So it's no? okay. Okay. No, then then that works okay because you are not in presentation mode. You are just showing us I, the raw lights, yeah. but they are full screen, so no problem. We'll yeah. see them. Just if you, if you hit yeah, if you hit there, then we'll be. No, it came to the same. No, no, it came to the same. No. But anyway, it works. It it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Okay. All right. Uh, can we start, Luis? Are you yeah. ready? Oh. Okay. So, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. I'm Alison Del Lago, and I would like to welcome you uh, to the Heliophysics and Space Geophysics Seminar promoted by the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research, INPI. In particular, this seminar is being hosted by the Space Geophysics Postgraduate Program and by the Research in Heliophysics Project, which is a part of the internationalization effort going on at our institute, sponsored by CAPES Funding Agency. Our guest today is Dr. David Gary Seibach from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Dr. Seibach received his PhD in Atmospheric Sciences from the University of California, Los Angeles. His current research focuses upon the interaction of the solar wind with the Earth's magnetosphere and ionosphere. At NASA headquarters, he served a two-year term as deputy program scientist, setting up and running the Living with a Star program, NASA's preeminent space weather program. At Goddard, he worked as project and mission scientist on the Themis Artemis Explorer mission and on the Van Allen probes mission. In recent years, he has taken on the leadership of a cross-disciplinary group prototyping a wide field of view soft X-ray imager with applications for solar wind, magnetosphere and solar wind planetary applications. He has served as editor and or guest editor for several major journals and uh, led the National Science Foundation's Geospace Environment Modeling GEM program. Um, he is past president of the American Geophysical Union's uh, Space Physics and Aeronomy session. Among his awards, I highlight the Mesa Wayne Award from AGU and the Medal for Contributions to the Interval Mission from Charles University. Dr. Seibeck has published over 380 refereed papers, and his most frequently cited first authored papers concern the responses of the Earth day side magnetosphere, ionosphere, and magnetotail to varying solar wind conditions. In recent years, Dr. Seibeck acted as a key person to help establishing a very productive research group on Earth radiation belts at INPE, Brazil, hosting visiting scientists and postgraduate students, as well as participating in INPE's Space Geophysics Postgraduate Program as doctoral advisor and evaluate, uh, evaluation committee member. So on behalf of INPE, I'd like to thank Dr. Seibeck for accepting our invitation to present his seminar on the STORM mission, which will address research topics of direct interest of our research activities at IMPI. So we ask the audience to mute their microphones during the presentation. Uh, you can ask your questions at the end, or if you prefer, you can write them down at the chat. Our colleague Vitor Souza will share the Q&A session. So it's all yours, David. Bom dia. Thank you for such a kind in, uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you, almost as great a pleasure as it would be to come down and visit again, but there will be a day when we can do that, and I look forward to coming back. Today, I would like to talk to you about STORM, the Solar Terrestrial Observer for the Response of the Magnetosphere, 
It is a mid-X mission, which is now in phase A. Phase A means to be studied and to be demonstrated that we can do that. Let's see if I can move on forward. Yes. So there were 13 proposals submitted to NASA last year to design, build, and fly mid-X or medium class explorer missions. Each explorer mission could receive as much as $250 million. NASA has decided that five of them are suitable for further study. These are the five missions that NASA is now considering. One is Solaris to look down at the sun's poles from high latitudes. The second is Muse to take much higher resolution images of the solar corona and its structure. The third is Helioswarm in which multiple small sats would be launched into the solar wind to study its turbulent structure. The fourth is Storm, which you'll hear about today. And the fifth is ARCS, in which 32 CubeSats at low altitudes will be sent to study the structure of the auroral oval in great detail. But we're going to talk about Storm today. And to get to this point, I had to convince people why we should do an imaging mission, why we should do it now. And as you mentioned in the introduction, I was a UCLA graduate. In fact, I was not in space sciences at UCLA in California. I was in atmospheric sciences. And I'm old enough to remember a time when we had to forecast the weather in Los Angeles at UCLA in California. And we had no idea what was coming from the Pacific Ocean. At our latitudes in the United States, weather moves from west to east. And we had no information at all about the Pacific Ocean, except that NOAA stationed a ship called Ship P in the Gulf of Alaska, up here at the asterisk. And so people would try to guess what would happen down here in California on the basis of observations made at Ship P. And what happened is that with the advent of um, infrared and other wavelength images from geosynchronous spacecraft, everything changed. You could actually watch weather fronts move across the Pacific. You could time how fast they were moving. You could see when they would arrive in California. You could determine whether they were strong or cold. Uh, and everything changed when you could do multi-wavelength imaging of weather in the Pacific. So this is a multi-wavelength imaging mission, STORM. It's going to get up far outside the Earth's magnetosphere and look down upon the magnetosphere. This is the cover page of our proposal. And in today's talk, I'd like to discuss with you a little bit about STORM's mission design and you'll see what drove us to make the decisions we made. We'll talk a little bit about the instruments that are on STORM. We'll talk about the science that we plan to do. I will invite you into this exciting project. We welcome cooperation, we welcome partnerships, and I'll give you a few places to do some further reading or contact in case you are interested in participating in STORM. So let's first talk about the launch and the orbit of STORM. We did not choose, we were directed. We were told by the announcement of opportunity for the proposal that we must be ready to launch in February, 2026. So we designed a schedule that would get everything done and have the spacecraft and all the instruments ready for launch by February, 2026. What happens after launch is seen in this picture. We want to get into a big circular orbit around the Earth. And the way that we do that though, is to first go out far beyond the orbit of the moon. Here's the orbit of the moon, this circle here, lunar orbit. Go out there at a distance that depends on the phase of the moon, because as we go out and come back, we want to meet the moon and use a lunar gravitational assist to get into this very high inclination orbit and come around and break and join the 30 RE orbit here. So first step, go out beyond the moon. How far you go out depends upon 
the timing you need to meet the moon on your way back in, to be flipped up out of the ecliptic, come down here and break, 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 slow down and get into a circular orbit around the earth at 30 earth radii with an inclination of 90 degrees. So if you do that, you, uh, by definition, we're going for a two year mission. So this orbit will precess around the earth, whoops, will precess, oh dear, will precess around the earth twice in two years. It's fixed in inertial space, goodness. And from this large radius perspective, we can use our different images to look, imagers to look down on the dayside magnetopause and magnetosheath, to look down on the auroral oval, to look down on the Earth's ring current, to look down on Earth's exosphere. At such a large radius, we also spend large periods of time in the solar wind, 30 RE from Earth. So we can take our own measurements of the solar wind input and take our images of what the response of the Earth's magnetosphere will be. The core instruments on the spacecraft are shown here. There are three imagers. The first is a soft X-ray imager. This is a prototype here. This prototype is going to be sent to the lunar surface in a couple of years as the LEXI mission. A smaller version of this telescope is going to fly as a CubeSat next year in low Earth orbit and look upward into the cusps. The CubeSat is called Cupid. The instrument seen in this picture that's going to the moon is going to be called LEXI, L-E-X-I, and similar instruments have flown on two rocket flights. So there's a, a steady progression of this instrument from small and short missions to long and uh, more dynamic missions. The energetic neutral atom imager is going, it has a long heritage at our partner institution, JHU APL. It measures the neutral atoms that are generated when uh, protons meet neutral hydrogen atoms and they fly off as energetic neutrals. So it is a good instrument for measuring the Earth's ring current and it has been modified so that it can measure lower energy neutrals down to like three keV which means it will also be able to image the Earth's plasma sheet. So we will image both the ring current and the Earth's plasma sheet with this instrument. Whoops. The third imager is a well-known far ultraviolet imager that UC Berkeley has built in the past. This instrument will measure the wavelengths of emissions from the auroral oval produced by both electrons and protons, two different wavelengths. As I mentioned, the, there is an ability to measure the solar wind input. We will use a Goddard magnetometer to do that. Goddard is well known for building magnetometers. And the Southwest Research Institute will supply a top hat electrostatic plasma analyzer. That's over here on the right. So uh, there are five core instruments on the spacecraft. However, we have a strong interest in knowing what is happening on the night side, in the night side auroral oval, because there are many interesting features that may precede or trigger substorms or may result from substorms. So the mission has an approved budget to place red and green line cameras, one each, at each of 14 locations in Alaska and Canada to look up at the nighttime sky and observe the auroral oval, the forward boundary intensifications, the streamers, the other features that people see during substorms. These are needed because these are very small scale structures with dimensions of only tens of kilometers wide that would be too fuzzy from a from an auroral imager 30 RE from Earth. So the target for this mission is the solar wind magnetosphere interaction, both geomagnetic storms and substorms. This mission can observe the solar wind input. It can image the magnetosheath 
determine the location of the magnetopause and cusps in soft x-rays. It can look for the auroral oval in far ultraviolet. It can observe the plasma sheet and ring current in ENAs. And it can observe the exosphere, Earth's outer atmosphere in neutral uh, Lyman alpha emissions. So these are the locations in this picture that are targeted by this mission. The day site magnetopause, the cusp, the plasma sheet, the ring current, and the aurora. The exosphere is a big, almost spherically symmetric, but not quite, we don't think it's perfectly spherically symmetric, a cloud of neutral hydrogen atoms surrounding the Earth, extending out many tens of Earth radii. Uh, the inner exosphere is fairly well known. The outer exosphere densities are not very well known, been rarely observed, so we'd like to get that too. By contrast, this is what we would expect typical observations from the mission to look like. We have an instrument measuring the solar wind density. In this example, we suppose it's constant. We have an instrument measuring the interplanetary magnetic field. Here we show a step function decrease from a northward to a southward turning. The soft X-ray imager looks down on the magnetosheath. This boundary, this shaded boundary here, is what we'd expect it to see at the bow shock. The inner edge, this boundary here, is approximately the location of the magnetopause. And it's the magnetosheath, which is emitting the intense emission. So this soft X-ray imager sees the magnetosheath, sees its inner edge, and sees its outer edge. That means it can find the magnetopause and the bow shock as a function of time. This is a simulation result, no such large field of view imager has flown yet to look at this region of space, but based on our knowledge of the exosphere, based on our knowledge of the plasma out there, based on astrophysics telescopes, which have looked through this region with very narrow fields of view, this is the emission strength, or this is the, the sort of thing we expect to see when looking at the day side sheath. By contrast, ENA instruments have flown on multiple missions, on twins and on image. And this is the intensity of emissions from the ring current surrounding the Earth. It varies greatly. It shows spatial structure. It increases during substorms and geomagnetic storms. We would like to have such an instrument to measure that response to on our mission, and we do. That instrument comes from APL. And the Berkeley instrument looks down on the auroral oval. This is the night side oval here. This is day glow from the sunshine on the day side. And this instrument can tell us something about the amount of open and closed flux or the onset of substorms and how they spread with time. Down on the ground, we have something similar to the Themis array. The Themis array of images are white light images. We expect to have two different wavelengths, red for seeing very faint features, green for catching sharp edges in the features. We have funding for 14 locations. We have yet to determine where those locations are. We have good ideas about them. And we will be talking to the Canadian Space Agency about that this afternoon. So today is a busy day here. We'll be going to Canada later today. Now the exosphere is a topic of interest to us. The, the amount of x-rays we can see and the amount of energetic neutral atoms we can see depends on how much plasma is out there, but it also depends on how many neutral atoms are out there. And we would like to be able to be quantitative, and we will be more quantitative if we have a good measure of how many neutral atoms are out there. In other words, if we know the density of the exosphere at distances ranging from 5 to 20 Earth radii from Earth. In preparing for this mission, we came across this fascinating paper by a Japanese colleague who had a Lyman Alpha imager on the Procyon spacecraft. This spacecraft was meant to go see an asteroid. On its way to that asteroid, they began to suffer failures. And so what they did was turn back to take this one single snapshot of the Earth, that's the dot here, surrounded by its neutral atmosphere in Lyman Alpha. 
In fact, that was the only science returned by that mission. But for us, that's wonderful because it meant we could find a partner who knew how to build a Lyman Alpha camera. Uh, he has applied for funding to the Japanese government and he is part of our proposal as a contributed instrument to help us understand the nature of the Earth's outer atmosphere, its exosphere surrounding uh, our planet. And he will, he will be, with a wide field of view, he'll be able to get information on the density of the exosphere, its time dependent response to variations in the solar wind, and any information there is about its azimuthal or latitudinal structure. And that just tells that it's important to know the exosphere, that is the neutrals, because the exospheres plus ring current produces ENAs, the exosphere plus solar wind ions produces soft X-rays. So the more we know about the exosphere, the better. Any mission that takes pictures had better be able to distinguish those pictures against the background. And fortunately, there's been a lot of work done uh, at the various wavelengths that we plan to image to do that. For example, we would like to image soft X-rays with energies of about 250 electron volts. And uh, the soft X-ray background is well known from the German spacecraft Rosat as a function of latitude and longitude surrounding the Earth. So that's the universe in soft X-rays as seen from the Earth at all latitudes and longitudes. And you can see that at very high latitudes, there are stronger background than at low latitudes. So Equatorial views are where it will be most easy to distinguish the soft X-ray signal, but given enough time and given our solid knowledge of the soft X-ray background, we will be able to deduce emissions from Earth's vicinity. We will be able to pick them out from this background in all directions. The Lyman Alpha sky is also well determined both in summer and winter and uh, modeled. And so we must pick out the emissions from Earth's exosphere against that background, but it's all been done before and given enough integration time, it's easy to do. Uh, the ENA instrument must detect its ENAs against UV background from the ultraviolet sky. And they have worked on that for many years. The far ultraviolet imager has already demonstrated its ability to pick out both electron aurora and proton aurora against any contamination. So this mission can launch at any time, any season, uh, without any trouble, and it will return results. Where does it fit in the big picture? Um, we're, we, my team, is actively involved in SMILE. SMILE is an ESA and Chinese Academy of Science mission that also carries a soft X-ray imager, but its field of view is smaller and its apogee is lower. So, and so it does not make continuous observations. It goes through perigee and that during perigee, no observations. And it doesn't see the entire day side magnetopause and magnetosheath. So storm fits in this region up here, long time scales, large spatial scales. It's kind of the opposite of MMS, which was studying the microphysics of reconnection at the magnetopause. But STORM is a partner for everybody because it's going to provide global pictures of the magnetosphere with any in situ mission that is available at the time. In situ missions can verify and validate the inferences we make from STORM. STORM can provide context for the in situ missions, tell them what's happening nearby or on a global scale. The science objectives for STORM are divided into four parts. The first is a desire to understand the nature of reconnection on the day side magnetopause better. The, sec oops, the second is to understand the response of the magnetotail to varying solar wind conditions and in particular to substorms. The third is to understand the sources and losses of ring current particles in the inner magnetosphere. And the fourth is to complete the circuit and understand how processes deep in the magnetosphere can affect things that are happening, for example, at the day side magnetopause or in the magnetotail. So in the first category, we have magnetopause reconnection. It's my favorite subject. 
during periods of southward IMF, we know from big statistical empirical studies that the magnetopause erodes inward. That's this arrow, erodes inward. And the magnetotail magnetopause flares outward. Okay, this is a statistical study. And you could ask whether it does that quickly or slowly in bursts or continuously. You could ask, where does it move inward? Where does it move outward? These are all questions that you would like to either have a thousand spacecraft in situ or one with a camera taking pictures of the global situation. And so that's where storm comes in. It's going to take pictures of the global pattern of where the magnetopause and bow shock are, and it's going to watch them move. It's going to take pictures of the ring current and determine how its structure changes. Pictures of the size of the aurora oval, how quickly it changes, and where it changes. What are we going to do with those pictures? Well, we're going to mark off where the magnetopause is, and we're going to compare it with the predictions of simulations. Some people believe the magnetopause moves quickly following a southward IMF, erodes inward quickly. Some people believe it moves in slowly. Some people believe it moves in in bursts caused by flux transfer events, a jump, a jump, a jump at a time. If only we knew where the magnetopause was as a function of time, we'd be able to distinguish between these models. And that's what we plan to do, simply to mark off where is the magnetopause and put it down on the predictions of different models and see which one of those models is correct. That's this picture. When it comes to the magnetotail, many different response modes have been proposed. Steady magnetospheric convection, isolated substorms, sawtooth sequences of substorms, substorms that occur during geomagnetic storms. People believe they have different occurrence patterns, different solar wind conditions determining which of these modes occur. Uh, people believe they have different triggers, or perhaps they have no trigger at all. Maybe it's purely intrinsic. For example, some people believe that they occur or are triggered by a northward IMF turning or the presence of oxygen in the magnetotail. So this mission has the ability to look for those sorts of things because we're measuring the solar wind ourselves. We can determine how much magnetic flux is available. We can see if there's a, a trigger in the solar wind. We can use the ENA instrument to look for thermal oxygen in the near Earth magnetotail. We can use the ENA instrument to see the plasma sheet thickness from the side. We can use our ground-based array to see if there are streamers, little wiggly swirls of, of aurora moving from high to low latitudes or beads, little dots on the aurora oval. We can distinguish between them. We can look at all these different modes of our proposed modes of night side response. And we have the different combinations of instrument to test each of the many hypotheses here, see which is most common. And we can even determine how much flux, magnetic flux each con consumes by watching how the auroral oval dimensions change during those events. So uh, a good thing about this mission is that it can readily track the Dungy cycle. It can watch the magnetopause erode inward on the day side following a southward IMF turning. It can use its FUV auroral imager to see the auroral oval expand, that's here. It can look for transient brightenings in the night side sky to test models for how substorms begin. Uh, full sequence all the way, all the way around during the Dungy cycle. When it comes to science topic three, that's the ring current, it's energization and loss. We have all these different modes of nighttime response. They pump or push uh, energized particles, ring current ions into the ring current. And we can simply observe the ring current as a function of time and see how its intensity varies for this night side activity. We can also see where the particles go because we know where the magnetopause is. And if, for example, ring current particles drift up to the magnetopause here, ions drifting up to the dust side magnetopause, there's contours show there's plenty of ions in the ring current on the dusk side. If we see a big absence on the dawn side, we will deduce that these ions drifted to the magnetopause and were lost to the magnetosphere and could not complete a circuit around the Earth. 
We can also directly measure the flux of ions that are being lost by charge exchange. That's what the ENA instrument observes. And we can get a grip on how many are precipitating into the atmosphere because precipitating protons elicit FUV emissions. And we're observing the aurora with our FUV imager. So we expect to have a good grasp of how the ring current strength increases during geomagnetic activity and how it decreases at the end of that activity and to distinguish between the source and loss processes and evaluate their strengths. Finally, we'd like to close the circuit. Uh, the ring current is not the end of this interaction loop. The ring current is proposed to have an effect on uh, reconnection in the magneto tail and on the magneto pause location. The ring current, you can use the right hand rule and you can see that the ring current enhances magnetic field strengths in the magneto tail, which may stop reconnection from occurring, may inhibit substorms. So there are proposals that when the ring current is strong, it's harder to make a substorm. We can check that. The way that you check that is to see if more open magnetic flux is needed in the polar cap for a substorm when the ring current is strong than at other times. The ring current also enhances magnetic field strengths in the day side magnetosphere and pressure balance may cause the magnetopause to move further outward when the ring current is strong. We can check that too. We measure the ring current with ENAs and we determine the location of the magnetopause with the soft X-ray imager. Let's move on. Oops. So in summary, uh, and this was important for NASA, we needed to show that we were dealing with the most important problems in, in uh, heliophysics for NASA. We are addressing reconnection on the dayside magnetopause and in the magneto tail. And we are addressing particle energization in the near earth tail and in the ring current. Some of the factors that determine the nature of our mission or what's novel or interesting about it is we have a highly inclined circular orbit. We need that so that we can get the global images so that we can look from all perspectives, both equatorial and polar, so that we can make our own measurements of the solar wind input. We have no perigee passes, so we can make continuous observations throughout the course of one to three day storms or even longer. The orbital period is 9.65 days for this mission. We have our own uh, ground-based array of imagers to see microstructure in the night side auroral oval. We have a big soft X-ray imager to track magnetopause and cusp motion on the relevant time and spatial scales. We can measure uh, all the way down to plasma sheet energies with our uh, ENA imager and therefore see something, get some information about the structure of the night side plasma sheet. Uh, this shows what you can do with a 9.65 day period. You can certainly see all the transient features that occur on shorter timescales in the magnetosphere, but you can make measurements throughout the course of geomagnetic storms, which last several days at a time. So every instrument on this spacecraft has a job. The X-ray imager sees the magnetopause and cusp. The FUV imager sees the oval. ENA imager sees the ring current and plasma sheet. The magnetometer and plasma instruments measure the solar wind. Our contributed Japanese instrument measures the emissions of lime and alpha that tell us the densities in the Earth's outer atmosphere. And the ground-based array tells us the microstructure of the aurora. But they're all meant to work together, not independently. And so if you want to study dayside reconnection, you will most likely be using the X-ray imager for the magnetopause and the ultraviolet imager for the auroral oval. If you want to study the magneto tail, you'll be using the all sky imagers and the FUV auroral imager. If you want to study the ring current, you'll need the ENA. If you want to see feedback, you'll take the ENA and see the effect on the tail, on the auroral oval or on the dayside magnetopause. But other topics which we did not really have space or time to discuss in the proposal include studying the, the, uh, the nature of the magneto sheath and its asymmetries and the exosphere. So if, you're, if 
if well, we're sure this mission will go and when it goes, what will you get out of it? You, a potential user, you'll get information about the solar wind. You'll get images of where the magnetopause is. You'll get images of the aurora oval, images of the ring current, images of the exosphere, images of night side aurora. And it's our declared intention to have a completely open data policy with rapid data dissemination. That's the best way to encourage joint projects. That's the best way to engage everyone everywhere in this mission. So if you'd like further reading, here are some of the papers that uh, motivated this mission. And if you email me at the bottom, I'll be happy to give you more detailed references. Um, these topics include the exosphere, the Dungey reconnection cycle, whoops, etc. What about STORM and you? Uh, STORM will provide a context for all magnetospheric missions and many ground-based observatories. STORM is a natural mission to work with global simulations, in particular MHD or hybrid code simulations for the solar wind magnetosphere interaction or simulations of the ring current. Uh, those simulations will help us interpret our observations and we can help verify the predictions of those simulations. We welcome partners in all of these communities. We have many friends in Brazil and we definitely look forward to your participation in this mission. If you're interested in STORM, let me know or let your advisors at INPE know, we'll, we'll, we'll engage you. And finally, uh, we are still in a competition. We still have to prove ourselves. And so we would welcome any comments or suggestions or criticism to improve our proposal. We have a lot of work to do. We have one year to do it. We have nine months to prepare a report. And at the end of 12 months from now, we have a big presentation to a visiting committee to see whether we've done a good job. So we, we greatly would welcome any suggestions or advice you have or comments. And that's it for my presentation. And I'd be happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you, David, very much for your talk. It's a great talk. And uh, we have some questions here. And I'll start uh, with my question first, okay. So what's the accuracy of the magnetopause location with the proposed imager? Yes, so uh, let, let me describe to you how that imager works, and then I will give you an answer. The every single photon that that imager sees will be time tagged and position tagged and sent to the ground. So the pixelization or making the images discrete will be done by decision on the ground rather than on board the spacecraft. And it is our calculation that for solar wind and the, the number of counts that it observes will of course depend on the density of plasma and the density of the exosphere in the vicinity of the magnetopause. So the number of counts by our calculation for slightly elevated solar wind densities or fluxes will suffice to produce at a minimum quarter of an earth radii resolution with three minute time resolution. As the solar wind flux increases, the number of counts will increase and we will make smaller and smaller pixels and or faster and faster cadence. It's a trade-off for us and, and it's our decision on how to bin the data in time or space as the count rate increases. But the good thing is during the most disturbed times, when solar wind pressures are high, we will get better and better cadences and or better and better resolution. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, David, for a clear answer. Um, so the next question is, uh, Claudia is asking, why launching the spacecraft in an equatorial orbit then migrate to a polar orbit? Is this a strategy due to the distance in RE the spacecraft needs to achieve? Yeah, it would take too much propellant to launch directly into, it would take a monster launch vehicle to launch immediately into a high inclination, high apogee orbit. Whereas this way we can gradually go out to the moon and use the moon's gravity to flip us up into this high inclination orbit. It, it is, it's easier, easier for the launch vehicle. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, so we have a question here that actually three people ask pretty much the same thing. So can this satellite show results in advances in understanding the South American magnetic anomaly? Uh, no, because the only way that it would know about the South Atlantic anomaly would be if we could image that in, in, uh, in, in the far ultraviolet. So I don't think that the emissions there are strong enough from the precipitation to produce a strong signal in the far ultraviolet camera. Okay, thank you. Um, so Giancarlo asks, um, he says that the solar community has the dream of performing in situ measurements of plasma and, ma and magnetic field. Since images are beautiful, but their interpretation depends a lot on assumptions about the in situ conditions. Yeah. So how important is the previous knowledge of in situ measurements to interpret the data of this new mission? Uh, absolutely. I, my personal background is from the in situ community. And so this is a, a remarkable break with the traditions that I came up with. All of the motivation, all of the past work, almost all of the past work that underscores this mission is based on in situ work in the past that helped me to understand what the possible time scales are, what the possible spatial scales are, and then led to a dead end. For example, a, a spacecraft that sees the magnetopause goes by, it knows where the magnetopause was right at that moment and can't say anything more about where it was before or after. But based on statistics in the past, we have some idea that erosion takes 30 minutes to an hour, pressure pulse driven motion takes you know one minute to 10 minutes to go by. So past work on in situ observations, in situ measurements of the aurora, the transients on the night side, gives us some idea about what capabilities are required for the instruments, both cadences and spatial resolution. Also some idea of what perspectives are needed. Absolutely essential. And um, although this mission is proposed as a standalone mission, it doesn't need help from anyone else to do its jobs. It will obviously do a much, much better job and with much more confidence and certainty, the more in situ measurements are available, both from the ground and from space. Okay, thank you, David. So the next question is from Livia Alves. She asks, uh, she says that the solar cycle 25 will be at the maximum around 2025, 2026. So I would like to know about the sensibility of the ring current measurements for broad intensity variations. Uh, we, uh... To the best of my knowledge from our partners, they're not concerned about the ring current being weak or strong. We would simply just integrate over longer time scales. And the kind of duration required to get an image of the ring current is on the order of 10 to 30 minutes. So that's, that'll be one time step. Uh, and I think we can handle both quiet ring current and strong ring current. Okay, thank you. So Alison Del Lago asks, how long does the phase A of storm last? Oh, so phase A is where we are now. Uh, we entered phase, we have, well, we kind of haven't entered phase A until two weeks from now when we will get the questions we must answer and we will get a set of tasks that we must perform over the course of the next year. We will have nine months starting in October to prepare a report answering every question that we have been given. And we will then have three months to prepare a site visit in which a team of experts will inspect everything that we have done in person looking at it. So we have a total of one year, one, one year work in phase A starting in October next month. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Graziella Diaz, and she asks about can, can radiation belts be observed with images from storm emission tube? If not, why? Uh, no, because what uh, radiation, when we, well, at least when I think about radiation belts, I am thinking about electrons, the electron radiation belt, and storm can only observe the, the uh, atoms that have, which are therefore are are uh, formerly protons or oxygen 
that have, that have gained an electron and become atoms. So let me say that slightly differently. In the ring current, there are singly charged protons and there are singly charged oxygen uh, ions. If they gain an electron, electron, they become neutrals and they move away without any constraint by the magnetic field. So we can observe the hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms shooting away from the ring current towards the observing spacecraft. But there's no corresponding process for electrons. They, they can't become neutrals. Only the hydrogen and oxygen ions can become hydrogen and oxygen neutrals and shoot towards the spacecraft. So that's what we image. Okay, thank you. And so the last question here is from Claudia Medeiros. And she asked, what do you think about to establish a partnership with Brazil to track this mission? I think that's a really good idea. <laughs> we, we have, we have a, a history of doing that with Van Allen probe. So I like that idea. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, David. So Alison, now you, you have the talk. Yeah. Uh, maybe, I don't know if someone else wants to ask any question from the audience. So. Um... I, I, I have a, a final, ah, maybe Walter wants to ask a question, right? Go on, Walter. Hi, uh, can I make a question? Yes, uh, go on. Uh, do you listen well? Okay, is, okay, I think uh, yes, I was- Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, uh, my question is uh, sort of re uh, related to what um, Beat already uh, asked you before. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, of the importance, of course, of this uh, mission, as you mentioned, is the global view of uh, structure, uh, the magnetopause and all this as compared to previous observations that were more localized, right? Uh, so um, uh, what, what is the possibility uh, to distinguish uh, the magnetopause with this mission uh, uh, because the resolutions that you had, I think the special resolution that you described, I guess, uh, how is it, would it be possible to distinguish some structures of the magnetopause, so localized structures and, uh, within the you know, global view? Okay, so what, what we can do is find the magnetopause. It will be difficult to identify a low latitude boundary layer uh, it might be possible to identify a plasma depletion layer outside of it, but the main objective is just find where is it. Uh, little structures like FTEs may be too small or move by too quickly for this imager to see, although we might see the effect of their existence as the magnetopause eroding inward. Um, I know you have an interest in the SMILE mission, and so I want to mention if we should be so fortunate to have the SMILE mission and this mission flying at the same time, that would be a spectacular opportunity to conduct tomography. Oh, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I think this is a great uh, mission. Uh, David, we wish you all, all the best. And I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. So I see Joaquin and Claudia with their microphones open. Do you? By any chance, want to ask any question? Just to say hi. <laughs> yeah, I I post hi. something in the chat. I see. Uh, I think you can read it, Joaquin. <laughs> yeah, go on, Joaquin. Okay, okay. Ask your own question. Uh, okay, I I wonder if uh, if this the the, the orbit of this a uh, storm mission is. Uh, Base, I think I understood something like that, right? Yes, nine point um, six five. Mm -hmm. How much this imposes limitations to the, the understanding of this interaction between the wind and and the magnetosphere? Uh, because you have in local measurements and then takes days to be on the other side of the orbit, and how much is is a problem? Maybe you should think about two two storm instead of one. Oh <laughs> like yeah, we wish we, we <laughs> wish we could afford, but but perhaps smile will be there. That's right. Um, I would like to say uh, you that's this is a very good idea. We uh, work closely with colleagues in the United United Kingdom and they have just responded to an ESA 2050 
uh, concept idea. And their concept was exactly what you just said, to put two missions 90 degrees out of phase, and therefore mm -hmm. to one, to do tomography, and two, to ensure truly continual observations. Let me, let me agree with what you just said. You know, yeah. when storm is near the equator, it's not really going to be able to look down on the auroral oval. And when storm is near the equator, it's gonna see the ring current from the side, but it's not gonna see the full range of ring current at all local times. If you had two missions, two spacecraft, as proposed by our partner Graziella Branduardi Remont to ESA in a recent document for some future mission, indeed, you would have true, you would have both tomography and continual coverage. Good. Thank you. David, we have one more question here oh, from the audience. Good. Actually, two questions. Good. Just popped out. Um, the first one is from Gonzalo Cushopadin. I yes. hope I spell it right. Uh -huh. Is a storm able to capture Leica images in its way to the moon, 19 RE? It would be a great opportunity to confirm in one image exospheric symmetries. Uh, it may be. Uh, it's something we can discuss with the imagers and with the spacecraft when we can turn on. The, the, it, it's possible. Certainly other missions have done that sort of thing. The, the engineers typically would like to leave the instrument turned off until all maneuvers are done and encountering the moon and breaking at Earth are, are big maneuvers. But perhaps we can turn on for a while and then turn off on the way to the moon. And there may also be some question about which way we're oriented to. But um, uh, uh, I know Gonzalo, and I think we're gonna take his input because I hope he is also gonna be partnering with us in this big endeavor. It's a good point. Great, thank you, David. And one question from Flavia Cardozo. Um, the day glow had to be removed from the FUV images in the past missions based yes. on empirical models. Yes. Is the day glow an issue to the other instruments as well? Uh, oh, so that's a wonderful question. So, okay, let's talk about the other instruments. The soft X-ray imager, it, uh, if it were to observe the earth, the earth would be so bright that all of the counts in that imager would come from day glow and the earth, and we would not get any information about x-rays from the sheath. Similarly, if the soft x-ray imager were even to observe reflected sunlight, that would be so bright that it would overwhelm the counts we want to see. So the soft x-ray imager is canted or tilted away from the earth to look at the subsolar magnetopause and it has very big sunshades to stop any light from the sun or the earth getting into the telescope. The FUV imager, as you said, uh, has, to, has to show, the referees did already ask us to prove that, and we have already proven that we know how to remove day glow from the images and get our results. And the ENA instrument does not worry about the about the air glow, it does worry about EUV from astrophysical sources, but they also demonstrated that, that their signal is much larger than those sources. Those are really good questions, really good question. Thank David, you, David. Uh, just one more question. You have uh, more than one stations around the world to track the signal in real time, or I, you... We will use a standard NASA network of stations, and I think all those details need to be worked out. So there certainly is a potential to cooperate with Brazil. David, is it a real-time mission? No, it's not a real-time mission. That is a heavy burden for something 30 Earth radii from Earth. If, if NASA wants it to be, of course, we will be delighted to do that, but the the, the mission designers, it's a partnership with Northrop Grumman. They found that to be not such an easy task to, to do it in real time. Is this X band? Uh, the yes. The yes. only? Yes. And, and yeah. S, S band and X band, yeah. Both, okay. 
Okay then. So if we don't have any more questions, so uh, on behalf of Wimpy, I would like to thank again uh, David Seibeck for this wonderful presentation, and thank all the audience for joining us in this uh, heliophysics and space geophysics seminar. Remembering that this is uh, promoted by the Space Geophysics Postgraduate Program at INPI, and it's being uh, part of the heliophysics project uh, that we have in our internationalization effort, which is sponsored by CAPES at, in Brazil. So David, thank you very much once again. It was wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity, delighted. Thanks, David. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Bye. David. Thank you, David. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye.